So um, um, actually, in my presentation, as a little bit of the background, I will briefly introduce about C4 and our global comparative study on Red Plus. So um, uh, I think that like most of you here today know more or less about C4, but just let to um, but just to um, give you an update on what we are doing um, and where we are working now um, with, with C4. So C4 is Center for International Fortune Research, and we were established in 1993, and our headquarters is in Bogo. And at C4, we mostly carry our international research on forestry, and um, um, most of our research uh, focuses on uh, pressing challenges on forest and landscape management around the world, with the hope that with our information analysis, we will inform the policies in all of the uh, study countries uh, with their policy designs and policies implementation. At the moment, C4 is working for, uh, in more than 40 countries, and there is a little bit of background on where we work and what topic that we are working in different countries and in different continents. At C4 in 2015, we have the new research strategies, and we restructured ourselves across the to the sustainable development goal. And at C4, we have six uh, thematic research related to forest, and uh, um, you know, some of the topic is on forest and human well-being. The other is on more on the forest governance topic, where we focus on equal opportunity, gender, and justice. And the global comparative study on Red Plus, um, and most of the finding today we present in this presentation, is belong to the thematic research on climate change, energies, and low carbon development. So let me just come back to the reason why we are doing our global comparative study on Red Plus. And this slide is actually give us uh, and, and also give you a website where you can actually looking for our information related to our project. But uh, the whole rationale why we wanted to do the global comparative uh, study on Red Plus in the first place is because at the beginning when Red Plus were proposed, it's all come up as a very nice idea. And it's a dream that we can do the climate change mitigation um, with Red Plus and achieve a quick and easy uh, solution. But soon after the Red Plus hit on the ground, there were so many challenges that different countries face. And it's actually a common challenge, um, such as like, um, the, the dominant of political politicals and economic in interests that are under, um, underlying and, and undermining the drivers of deforestation. We talk a lot about the weak coordination among sectors and also among different government agencies. And it is something that all of the country facing uh, when they are designing and implementing Red Plus. We also have to face the problem of internal securities and the safeguard is not in place. And the transparencies at the Paris Agreement uh, kind of highlights in the document, transparencies and also accountable uh, governance and legitimacies in decision making is something that all of the countries are facing um, and, and also is one of the major barriers for hindering the actual implementation of Red Plus in most of the countries. With that, a challenge is that most of the countries are sharing and also facing when they are designing and uh, implementing their Red Plus policies. In 2009, um, C4 had a, a, um, a funding from NORAD and together with many other donors to carry out our global competitive study on Red Plus. And if you can see now, um, it is a very long-term project. Uh, and we have a long additional data from 2009. And we are now in the third phase. And our project will last until 2020. And the whole objective of our C4 Global Comparative Study on Red Plus is to support Red Plus policies arena and also Red Plus communities and practitioners with information analysis and tune uh, to inform all of the key stakeholders and countries so that when they design uh, or implement uh, Red Plus to ensure that the Red Plus policy will have the three E outcome. And in this framework, what we mean with effectiveness, efficiencies and equities is uh, with the effectiveness uh, how effective the policy can tackle the drivers of deforestation and degradation. Efficiencies refer to how Red Plus policies can actually implement it in a cost-efficient way. And with equity and co-benefit, to what extent and uh, how Red Plus can be implemented, uh, taking into account the fairness and also equitable outcome for all stakeholders uh, involving in the process. And as again, our project could not have been done with all of the financial support from different donors. But uh, so far, NORAD is our uh, biggest donor. So we express our special thanks to the donor. 
Um, uh, let me quickly introduce about the C4 um, Global Comparative Study and the three phases of our project. From 2009 until 2012, most of our research focused on the overall designs of Red Plus. So when the country is designing Red Plus, what, um, what factors and what issues that need to be taken into account based on our previous uh, uh, knowledge and also research? In, um, in phase two, from 2012 and 2015, our research focused on the evolving of the policies process. So actually, when Red Plus were designed in the first phase, how it's actually implemented actually is on the ground, and what are the challenges that all of the country face? Um, also, in, in this particular phase, uh, from 2016 to 2020, uh, our research will focus mainly on the assessment of the policy design to actually so hopefully being able to measure some of the actual outcome in the uh, Red Plus policies arena. And uh, with our global comparative study on Red Plus, then in, in, in overall we have been working in more than uh, 17 countries, crossing through from Southeast Asia to Latin America and Africa. And uh, more or less, um, um, all of these countries in our continent are still our active countries. But in this uh, phase three, we have two new countries, Myanmar and Guyana, uh, because Myanmar uh, is a very interesting study, and we are very lucky to have a partnership with uh, the Ministries of Forestries in Myanmar and the Forest Research Institute um, to engage in this study. We also um, have a new country, Guyana, because among all of the countries to date, Guyana is the uh, first and also perhaps the only one to date receive the payment from Norway. And our college from Guyana can update to us more, uh, hopefully during the panel discussion. Uh, in terms of the how we structure our research uh, uh, with the GCS Global Comparative Study on Red Plus, we basically have five work package in our project. The first work package is uh, on M1, where we're looking at the national policies and, and process. And we try to understand how different countries designing Red Plus policies, whether or not it's successful, is any encounter policies or uh, measures of policy that actually hinder or enable Red Plus policies work in, in, in certain contexts. Um, in order to complement with our first component, where we're looking at the national level, we have model two, uh, where we're looking at different type of um, uh, Red Plus pilot uh, projects across the world, and uh, hopefully to inform the lesson learned how these Red Plus uh, uh, pilot projects um, can offer to the national policies making, what are the lessons learned, and, and how actually um, the Red Plus activities implemented on the ground. We have the third model, uh, models, which is led by Nikki, who is wearing here, she's waving her hand. Um, and uh, that particular model is more on the technical side of, of, of Red Plus, where we are working on MRV and, and designing it. And later slide, we will talk more about that. We have another model calling multi-level governance, uh, where uh, different research uh, try to understand how Red unfold at different levels of governance. And also we're looking at the possibility to join between mitigation and adaptation in Red Plus policies and forestry policies in as overall. And the final component, which is we have Christy at the back here, is more on the knowledge sharing uh, kind of work package, where we hopefully to be able to pull out information from different models and uh, disseminate and communicate and share uh, with different stakeholders. And we're also doing a lot of training on the CSO and also media on um, what would be the um, interesting topic uh, and relevant topic related to Red Plus? Oh. So um, just to give a little bit of quick um, information on some of the research finding that different work package the have, uh, have had to date. And of course, over the course of today, we will be more than happy to share in detail if you um, are interested in any uh, research component within our project. But uh, just again with the model one, where we're looking at the national policies process, one of the interesting work, which is led by Maria, uh, who is sitting over there, she can waving, and also Kaisa over there, is on our comparisons on the Red Plus policies and progress in um, 13 countries from 2012 until 2006. And basically, um, the latest findings from 2006, where you see different progress in different countries where we're working with, and um, in this um, QCA paper, they also identifies a numbering of factors and a combination of factors 
why uh, in some of the countries they make a very good progress on REP plus and some uh, in, in other countries the progress is not yet there. And uh, if you're looking at the list of the 13 countries, some of the countries make a very good progress, uh, such as Brazil, Guyana, and also to some extent the RC. Um, we don't, I mean, it's, it's very unfortunate that we don't have um, an expert from DRC today, but some of our colleagues can also explain on the case of uh, DRC. And um, I mean, we don't analyze this so among the 13 countries. We also see some of the countries, such as like in Vietnam and Tanzania, where they are a little bit uh, back and forth with the Red Plus policies, and uh, there was a lot of challenges. Uh, there was a whole document uh, and also the reference at the end, and if you are interested to know more about uh, the paper and our actual work, we have the two lead authors here, and we are more than happy to share um, our uh, paper in hard copy or electric version. With um, uh, M1 on national policy process, over the year we also doing a, a different uh, kind of uh, angles on, on, on Red Plus policy. Uh, some of the things we working, we're looking at specific uh, lesson learned from different uh, beneficiary mechanisms in different countries. For example, in the case of Vietnam, we're looking at the payment for environmental services, which is considered by the government of Vietnam as the backbone for the Re, the, uh, Red Plus beneficiary mechanism. We also have a latest uh, document uh, led by Kaisa where we're looking um, at Red Plus uh, as a form of experiment for transformation chain in, in terms of governance. We also have a comparative paper looking at what are the risks for Red Plus um, uh, when you are actually implementing uh, Red Plus in different countries and with different contexts and the paper is up there. We're also looking um, at uh, institutional and also behavior chain and also discourse and that is some of the paper here. So just to get you uh, a flavor of what we are actually doing at w M1 and what are the potential output based on our uh, research to date. Uh, with the model two, where, uh, where my colleague, Amy Dushaw, she could not hear today, but we are more than happy to give her contact if you are particularly interested on the subnational implementation of, of Red Plus initiative and project. So in this one, we have the countries of the Red Plus project and initiative in six countries, and here is the map. And uh, we are actually covering the 22 initiative, and we have the database from uh, more than 150 villages. And the database that we collected for the last um, seven and eight years is uh, is quite large, with 4,000 households. And, and in this particular model, my college uh, at M2, they was actually measuring the actual impact of Red Plus um, using the uh, before after control and intervention methodology, and. Uh, uh, some of the key findings to date, uh, which is now pulling out from our um, study at the subnational level, is if you're looking in terms of the impact, um, in terms of Red Plus impact on forests, based on our sampling um, at six countries and 23 initiatives, we see a very minimum reduce in three uh, cover loss at different Red Plus size. And, uh, but actually, if you compare between the side where we have Red Plus and the side where we don't have Red Plus, then the performance appear worse um, in the case without any controls. And um, at least if you can see uh, in the impact of forest, uh, based on the household surveys uh, result, uh, two thirds of the household at the red side uh, subject to intervention, and 65% uh, of them actually reported on changes in land use. And I think we have Mela here. Uh, and also some of the college from C4 here working on M2. Um, that can also explain uh, in detail if you are interested in that particular component. Um, in, in, in Indonesia, there was also a study conducted by our college under the, uh, M2 where they pulled out whether or not the Red Plus project initiative had any positive impact on biodiversity. And they're using the case studies of Indonesia at, at, at one of the example. And basically, uh, with the study to uh, with, with the finding to date, um, we found that uh, Red Plus initiative in Indonesia um, located in high biodiversity area, but with lower than average carbon uh, density. So it has a whole implication whether or not Red Plus can actually generate any positive impact on biodiversity. In terms of the impact on Red Plus on people, um, with the finding to date, we see no negative impact on welcome, uh, income and well-being but also no evidence on co-benefit. 
Um, we also see that there is a very little advancement on tenure, um, even those uh, different type of project and different initiative in six countries put um, the tenure securities improvement as one of their objective. We also see with our subnational level uh, initiative is the, um, the, ins uh, the existing incentive had to alleviate negative well-being impact of uh, regulation alone. And uh, there will be more paper coming out. Uh, and, and if you are interested in that finding, um, as I said, I would be more than happy to put you in contact with uh, my colleague, Amy, who are leading um, that component. Um, on the Model 3s on MRV, just to give you an idea of what we are exactly doing, we're doing a lot of uh, assessment on existing capacity of the national capacity in uh, designing and implementing MRV. In terms of the technologies and the method design, um, we're also working on to the monitoring concept, try to understand different drivers of deforestation and degradation in different countries. We're working with also um, reference emission level uh, and, and some of our college also supporting many governments in developing their MRV system, like for example in the case of Yana. And we also have some uh, testing on communities-based monitoring method. Um, and if you are interested in this particular um, work package, we have Nikki here, and I think that Nikki can explain more and sharing to us the more update finding. With Model 4, we, um, there is a type of question that we wanted to ask ourselves and also together with the national partner in different countries. We try to understand how Red Plus has been interpreted and has been implemented uh, at different um, governance level. A and with that kind in mind, we ask several key critical questions. Who make decisions and how decisions are made uh, from international, national, subnational level? And also try to understand the complexity of relationship between actors at multiple uh, uh, level. And this work package is led by um, Anne Larson. She's not here today, but again, if you are interested in the uh, research methodology and also the research finding to date, we are more than happy um, to provide the contact and, and also uh, connect you to, to Anne Larson. Um, uh, some of the multi-level um, challenges that we found in all of the countries that we are working is actually in all of the countries, maybe that's not new to most of us here, but uh, horizontal cross-sectoral um, coordination, uh, either or not, uh, whether it's cross-sectoral coordination or within sectoral coordination, um, has been quite, um, um, quite challenging and is actually very limited in, in, in most of the countries. Um, and it's also very interesting because um, for the last, uh, since 2009, every year we have an, our annual meeting uh, where different countries, uh, team members, like many of them are here, update to us about the Red Plus policies and progress. And surprisingly, for so many years, um, like two days ago, when we have the update information for most of the countries, coordination um, and collaboration is still one of the biggest challenges in, in, in most of the countries where we're working with. Um, and also, we we also um, doing a little bit of analysis again on the complexity of relationship among different uh, uh, level, um, and and we see the whole findings coming out from the analysis is the central government overrides subnational government decision, and at the same time, in many countries, the subnational government ignore the central government. So there was a very weak linkage uh, between. Um, central government and, and, and subnational. And also, um, if you're looking at the project per se, then uh, most of the projects that are working on Red Plus often the target, uh, you know, proximate, but not the underlying drivers of deforestation and degradation. So it's also questioning a little bit about their effectiveness in tackle the drivers of uh, deforestation and degradation. Um, just one again, I wanted to highlight this, this is slide, which is the, uh, our happiest moment of all of the year. It's because our work cannot be done in uh, the 13 countries or 17 countries, and now eight countries in the third round, without a large number of um, you know, national partners and research who are helping us and have been together with us in this journey. And once again, um, taking this opportunity, I would like to express our special thanks again to all of our partner who are here and, and being with us uh, since 2009. And just to say that um, the C4 project in this way is a very collaborative effort. We're doing it together with country partners and our national partner. So that on the one hand, we'll be able to generate a global lesson learned, 
But at the same time, we, we, we want to make sure that whatever we produce with our research are useful and can inform some of the lessons learned for the country's partner and the, the policy uh, maker in, in the countries that we are studying. So again, that is just a big team. And uh, today, we're only able to have seven teams come because of so many reasons. But just to say that uh, there is an um, incredible collaboration effort. And, and thanks again, um, everyone from all the team who are here with us today. And um, again, that is the final slide. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of the time because I understand that the panel discussion would be the highlight for today. But just again, um, thank you everyone for coming. And you have all of the contact uh, person from C4 uh, Global Comparative Study Project with different components. And if you have any question or if you have any interest, uh, please let us know. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you very much, Tui. Um, maybe any follow-up uh, questions or clarification? Otherwise, uh, I will invite uh, Bethany Davis, our moderator for the session, and also our country expert uh, to come uh, to the stage and uh, we can start the talk show. This, this talk show is also accessible online uh, through a webinar, so we will have uh, our online uh, participants uh, who will send us questions. Uh, thanks, Cynthia. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bethany Davies. I, I work with C4. Um, my role this morning is simply to moderate. So I'd like to invite all of our uh, country representatives to join me uh, upstage. Uh, if we could seat ourselves in order from this side through. So if Myanmar and Ethiopia could sit down this end and um, Guyana and Brazil more on that side. Um, Excuse us where we got organized. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Um, so as, uh, Ibu, as Tui pointed out, uh, this morning what we have done is invited seven of our research collaborators from the seven different countries we've been working, well, from seven of the 13 different countries we've been working with over the last several years, um, who've been collaborating with us to analyse how different countries are approaching planning and implementing Red Plus in, in very different contexts. So we've asked them this morning to try and distill these very complex and nuanced um, experiences into some, some key insights um, that they can share with us uh, by focusing on uh, a couple of highlights, um, so highlighting the key areas of progress that each country has made uh, in their implementation. Uh, so the first half of this forum this morning, we'll ask them to share a very brief uh, highlight from the, the implementation in each of their countries and then uh, explore some of the, the drivers and constraints that have helped uh, and hindered the, the achievement of this progress. 
We're going to then take a, a short coffee break and then afterwards we'll reconvene the panel and we'll be interested in having a, an, a participant driven discussion. It will be your opportunity to, to drill into the details and explore some of the, the experiences of each of these countries. And each of these countries is at very different stages in their, their journey of Red Plus implementation, from some countries that are uh, in the early stages or later stages of Red Plus readiness, some that are more progressed into the development of policies and measures, and some of our colleagues are more in the stage of already receiving their um, results-based payments. So we'll work through those sequentially this morning. Um, and we, we have very limited time and a very full panel. So we've actually decided to dispense with a few of the formalities. We're not going to spend a lot of time introducing people and where they're from and where they're working with. Um, if you're interested in that level of detail, those details are in the agenda or we'll refer you to the C4 website. So without uh, further ado, I might begin with our colleagues from Ethiopia. So Lam Lam is joining us from Ethiopia. And I was wondering if you could start by sharing some of the, the key areas of progress that you're, you've experienced, you've observed in your, your country study. Thanks so much and good morning everybody. So I am so excited by being the first speaker of among the, all these countries and let me update you about some of the policy progress that my country just made. By the way, my country is in the uh, finalization of this the readiness process in the, finalization, in the finalization stage. So there are some policies which are conducted after 2015. So let me update you about the country profile and some of the policies which are changing after 2015. So the, some of the policy changes are one of the major change that considered to be that is the major in Ethiopia is that is the revision of the forest proclamation that is the one in the most important thing in the previous period the forest was owned by the state and the private sector however in the recent period the forest is going to become owned by it's said it is just put in the proclamation to be owned by the communities and associations so this one is one of the great change in ethiopia so the inclusion of this one is one of the good thing and the other one is just the development of MR review unit at the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change that is one of the other good change in my country and the development of forest reference emission level in the sum it's just submission to UNFCC is that is the other important issue and the other one is also in order to uh, just conduct the MR review the redefinition of the forest is also the other important issue which is conducted in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is just, that is the first from Africa, that is the first to submit the forest, refer the forest reference emission level to UNFCC. And also, Ethiopia is also the first to develop the biocarbon fund in the fund which is obtained from the World Bank. And it, it is the first country in Africa to submit the forest reference level in the UNFC and it applies also the first from the few countries implementing the landscape, the landscape level biocarbon uh, program in oral margins through, sending through the fund which is obtained from the World Bank. So these are some of the achievements which obtained from Ethiopia regarding the risk plus issue. Thank you. Um, we might pass on now to our colleague speaking from uh, Myanmar. Uh, so Yia is joining us with me from Myanmar, who's, and Myanmar is probably at the earliest stage of Red Plus development of anybody speaking today. Would you like to share the progress that you've made so far? Yeah. Yeah, Myanmar. Hello. Yeah, Myanmar is just like a initial state, like a preparation state of the Red Plus. So we start to be a Roblox partner country in the UN Red in 2011. Start from that time, we start to prepare the Roblox roadmap, and then we form the technical working group at the time. And so we uh, we just start the two uh, uh, sub-national level project, uh, just only two, and then we start to do the capacity building program. And after that, 
uh, start from 2015 and 2016, we have a, a, a UN Red Target support. So that time we start to prepare the uh, uh, strategy and Rebla strategy and FIO. So currently we have submitted the draft of the FIO to the UN Red in 2018, just in, in January. So and then regarding the uh, a strategy, we just finished the draft and that is like a consolidation meeting around the country. So yeah, that that one will be uh, a validate, a validation workshop will be in the June. So after that, we will complete in the Rebless strategy. So we, we now we have uh, maybe four or five Rebless projects that are running in Myanmar. So we just, we are just very, yeah, initial state in the Rebless. Yeah. Thank you. And moving on to our colleagues from Indonesia, Vietnam and Peru, you've been working on these, these countries have been working on these issues for a while longer and have made some significant development in laying the groundwork and creating the enabling environment for Red Plus to be implemented. We might begin with uh, Ibu Moira from the Indonesia study team. Could you provide us with an update on where things are at in Indonesia? Okay. In Indonesia, after an early start and a uh, uh, sort of uh, wide uh, uh, initiatives for, for RDD uh, in the earlier government, in 2015, the change in government has put RDD back in the box. So basically, uh, everything that's happening now is happening in the Ministry of Environmental Forestry. Uh, there have been some uh, progress, but basically Indonesia is hovering between uh, different stages and on the threshold of implementation, but uh, lifting the feet to implement it has been very difficult. So there have been recently some new regulations which uh, establish the general mechanism for RDD, the registration system, the MRV, and the inventorization of greenhouse gases new regulations within the Ministry of Forestry. And uh, outside the RDD, there has been the continuation of moratorium for new licenses. There has been a big effort to uh, uh, rehabilitate, restore peatlands. And with that also attention to, uh, to uh, diminish fires, which all affect how RDD can uh, operate later on. And then there is the map, one map policy. So that's in a nutshell, thank you. Yeah. So uh, also like in Indonesia, Vietnam is quite, uh, it wa was one of the pioneer countries in Southeast Asia because we had already the national red plot strategies in 2011 and 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, last year we have a revived version of the national red plot strategies. In the previous version, we had a very general commitment to red plus, but the national red plot strategies didn't uh, tackle to the drivers of deforestation. And with the revived version, which were published last year, um, uh, last year, um, the new NRAP uh, and the new um, national red plot strategies directly tackle to the drivers of deforestation and um, degradation, which is a major achievement in, in the countries like in Vietnam. Um, in Vietnam, we submitted the uh, uh, emission level to the UN Triple already um, in the early of 2017, and already finalized the beneficiary mechanism through a uh, red plus fund. And now we are now in the state of finalizing the safeguard framework and uh, it is expected that by the end of this year, the national safeguard system will be operationalized in Vietnam. Um, I think that one of the highlights that we would like to share is that um, if you can see in my earlier slide, among of the 13 countries, Vietnam and Tanzania, um, is a little bit of uh, backward in terms of Red Plus because we were very active in Red Plus in the first um, phase. But um, over the time, the political commitment and the political interest of the government on Red Plus has been reduced. And um, just two weeks ago, um, even though uh, in the past we have the National Red Plus Steering Committee uh, chaired by the Prime Minister and with the participants from all of the ministries um, actually supposed to be coordinating Red Plus policies in Vietnam, a few weeks ago that uh, Red Plus Steering Committee has been dissolved 
And uh, uh, even though two weeks ago we still have the independent and standing red plus office, two weeks ago we don't have any more the, the, the red plus office because that red plus office has been merged um, again into another department under the ministries of forestry. So in the previous phase, we wanted to go out of the sectoral approach and we wanted to have a multi-sectoral approach in addressing Red Plus. And now we're going back to the starting point where Red Plus is going back to the ministries of agriculture and rural development and only under the Department of Forestry. So we are not yet quite sure what would be the future of Red Plus, but there is a challenge definitely in actually uh, translating our national commitment and, and the Red Plus policies um, on the ground. Thanks. And Javier from Peru, would you like to give us a, a little bit of an update? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Have you ever tried to put an elephant inside a bottle? I feel like this uh, because I just have two minutes to explain like 10 years of red in my country. I'm going to try to do a short brief about my country. I had been working in red for more than 10 years and summarized the Peruvian experience very hard. In fact, now I have just one and a half minutes. Okay. As you know, Peru is in South America. It's a big country. Indonesia is 1.4 times bigger than Peru. We have 128 million of hectares and you have 181 million. And 56 of our country's forests. We have dry forests, highland forests, and rainforests. Rainforests represent more than 94% of our forests. 51 of our GSG emissions are in land use and land use chain forestry sector. However, our forest sector just means 1% of our GDP. That sounds strange because in some countries, that has like a lot of uh, GSG emission and energy, the GDP increase. But in our country, 51% is land use and land use change emission and just 1% of our GDP. We started to talk about red 10 years ago and Peru is part of a lot of different process in forest carbon part partnership facility, um, FIP, the forest investment program, ONU Red, and some key actors are World Bank, IDB, Norway, Germany. Now we have a climate change policy since March, two months ago, it's like a new law. And our NDC is 30% according with the business as usual scenario. And 67% of our CO2 GSG reduction uh, are in forests. And also we have a national strategy of forest and climate change. Two minutes? More. In, in just a, right. another 30 seconds, yeah. could you talk a little bit about um, the progress that Peru is making in terms of Red Plus specifically? When we started to talk about Red, I imagine like the three phases, like readiness, implementation and result based payment. In fact, now, nowadays in Peru, we have the three phases at the same time. We have like working in the readiness process. Uh, we have some projects and some companies uh, bought like uh, carbon credits now. And that's interesting because when it's like when you design a process, you can imagine like first readiness, implementation, no? it's like your brain works like this. But uh, it's hard to coordinate between different stakeholders and the reality is different. Okay, thank you. So everything happening all at once yeah. in a very challenging situation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and our last two country representatives. Yeah, would you be able to provide us with some information? It's a pleasure to be here. So Brazil is advanced in the um, implementation of Red Plus in a way that we uh, that Brazil has already uh, launched its uh, national strategy on Red Plus since 2015. Uh, Red Plus was also included uh, in the NDC. 
Um, Red Plus is framed in Brazil under, um, under other policies that are already in, in, in place. So, for example, the National Policy on Climate Change and the New Forest Code from uh, 2012. So, in this sense, the enforcement of the Forest Code is really important uh, for the country. I was also asked to talk a little bit about command and control. Uh, why? Because basically, inside the forest code, the, the plans on combat to, of deforestation uh, is based on the command and control uh, approach. But uh, in Brazil, the control part, the follow-up of policies is really uh, difficult. Uh, sure, there are some estimated uh, calculations that uh, shows that the command and control approach uh, played and plays a real, uh, a big role in, um, in the decreasing uh, of deforestation. Uh, but some specialists, as myself, do not believe this is the only reason. So, uh, for example, some economic instruments or like uh, market fluctuations have also influenced in this context. Uh, and this put the effectiveness of command and control on check, especially in the long term. So uh, surely we have achieved uh, uh, a level of success in decreasing deforestation, but for how long? We have been deforesting much longer than we have like, uh, decreasing the deforestation rates. So the deforestation rates in Brazil are increasing again since 2013. Um, many argue that happened um, because of some changes in the first code that weakened uh, the command and control approach in the country. But on the other hand, there are also some evidence that uh, there is a um, change of behavior in the um, deforestation activities. And um, uh, however, uh, For example, the deforestation rates are uh, happening in small patches uh, nowadays. But um, there are also evidence that this is not happening because of a higher number of uh, small holders, but because larger uh, landowners have learned to trick the monitor systems. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they even develop some techniques as, for example, to make an inventory of the, the area, but to cut the shorter trees and leave the forest cove there. So since the monitor system is based on the canopy, the canopy is still there. And also another evidence from the command and control uh, approach is that usually the small holders, uh, they pay the bill. Because since we have a, uh, a large uh, or a high level of corruption in the country, the large landowners, they just bribe the system. Thank you. And thank you. And just finally, Vanessa, who will be up speaking to us from Guyana. Thank you and good morning. I'm very happy for this opportunity to speak about my country, Guyana. So Guyana is, is um, on the same continent, sister, country to, to Brazil um, and lies on the north of the uh, South American mainland. Um, we are a highly forested country, over 75% um, forested, with very low deforestation, um, historic low deforestation of less than 1%. A um, country as well that where our main economic centers are two meters below sea level. And so climate change and the, 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 you know, the consequences of climate change are key to, to Guyana's future. Um, also, a country that has 14% of our land mass um, issued as title, is, is uh, actually um, owned as a title deed by the indigenous peoples of our country. So that helps to give a context. Um, our, um, our involvement with Red Plus um, builds on the, 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 the tradition in our country of having sustainable forest management um, and including aspects of reducing impact logging, etc. So you have um, you know, a very low impact on the forest as, as best as possible. But you know, listening to my colleagues from, from Brazil and from Peru um, about the impacts of, of what is causing deforestation, 
as I mentioned, um, you know, we have over 75% of, of our of our forest of our land mass that is, is forest cover. Um, but where the, the the emissions are deriving from, um, and where the, the deforestation and forest degradation is occurring is within the forest estate as well, but not because of forestry primarily, because of mining and gold mining in that aspect. Um, with regard to um, the results-based um, payment system I was asked to speak about, um, we have had um, a policy in the country from 2009 where the president at that time launched what was called a low carbon development strategy. It, um, the intention, the initiative, was to transform the country's economy to a low carbon um, pathway um, and to ensure that as part of that um, uh, transformation that the citizens were able to benefit um, and that it would not come at the cost of affecting the livelihoods of the people um, you know, who depended on, 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 the, on those natural resources. Um, with regard to the opt-in mechanism, I think I was asked to speak about as well. Uh, so let me back up a bit. So we have since 2009 this climate policy that is, that is nationally applied, the low carbon development strategy. And out of that, we were um, successful in having an agreement signed with the Kingdom of Norway for an agreement for five years of up to um, a payment of 250 million US dollars for the, uh, to ensure that our deforestation rate did not raise above a particular reference level, a particular benchmark. Um, we have been successful in implementing that <coughs> project over the years. Uh, it ended in 2015, I believe, a five-year project. Um, we are in the stage where we have a kind of a low cost, no, 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 no cost extension uh, for that agreement so that we can, can continue to um, implement the actions of it. But our current government is also in discussion with Norway on you know, prospects of, of, of having a new ag agreement, et cetera. Um, with regard to what payments we have received thus far, we have received about 190 million US dollars um, over, over the years. Um, how it is assessed? We have, um, we've been using wall-to-wall um, -wall assessment of satellite imagery um, to assess the, the land use changes, and that is matched with ground truthing, uh, particularly with the support of um, indigenous communities who have been involved in a CMRV. Have I gone over time? <laughs> I hope not. Uh, but yes, who have been involved in community monitoring, um, reporting, and verification, and so that has helped the, the, the MRVS to become more <coughs> credible, more robust. Um, I believe I, I, I should close here. Thank you. Thank you so much for each of you for those those brief overviews. Um, I, we are also quite interested in hearing um, from each of you. We might begin with you and maybe work backwards down the panel. Uh, in the in the context in which you're working, in order to achieve what you've achieved so far, uh, what are some of the the drivers that have supported that achievement, and what are some of the complications that you've experienced? I guess um, this study particularly uses Red Plus as the the, the target for the study, but what it's really discussing is how do policy and practice changes occur in these very highly contested, very complex spaces. So we're really interested in understanding some more detail about what drives and enables and constrains some of these transitions within different countries and different contexts. Thanks. Well, I, I would say one, one of the key things, one of the, th the uh, two of the key things have been the leadership at the, at the level of the, the government and the, the, you know, and the policy in that, matched with um, stakeholder involvement and building awareness of, of, the, of the citizens to understand why the country is engaged in these, in these kinds of, of, of arrangements. So for instance, a country like Guyana that has such high, you know, high forested cover and very low deforestation rates, you would have had to ad address issues like, why are we worried about climate change where we are maintaining our forests and other countries haven't? So why do we continually have to do things and perhaps um, you know, curtail some of our activities. So quite a lot of consultations have been held and continue to be held um, across the country. There is also what is called a multi-stakeholder steering committee and an expert group that helps to inform the process, that helps to address perceptions and misconceptions and build people's understanding. This, all of this coupled with building um, uh, 
capacity and institutional capacity, human and institutional capacity, in those agencies that are involved in the process. So it's, there's, no, there's not one answer, it is just a kind of coordinated effort that is within the, the, the structures, the government structures, but also very key in involving all the, the stakeholders across the country. So those are some of the features that have enabled. Have you run into particular challenges as well in terms of um, progressing to the point that you have and actually being able to achieve those targets and receive the payments from your... I wonder where I should start. Um, <laughs> not, not particularly in a negative way, but as in my view, I'm not speaking on behalf of the government, in my view, a kind of a learning process and that's why I see the value of, of, of this engagement, because it helps us to share and to learn what experiences are. So for instance, as part of the agreement we've had with Norway, um, and you know, Guyana being kind of a guinea pig, sticking his neck out and getting into this arrangement, and not really having examples to learn from. And so um, Guyana has, um, through its partnership with Norway and with support of you know, international organizations, um, both local and overseas and so on, um, Guyana has been able to kind of balance itself, for the want of a better description, to deal with the issues that may not have been considered at the inception of the agreement. So for instance, while we have, um, you know, the, the forest laws are continually being revised over a periodic process, um, and, uh, you know, you look at the policies and so on, and all the other things that match it, um, th there was a kind of a surprise, perhaps, um, in my view, that there was a necessity to go towards um, the EU flecked VPA process. So that was one of the requirements. Um, it is not a negative because I think it, I, I know that it's helping the country to improve um, the issues related to logging and compliance with, with not only national but international um, you know, you know, no conditions. Um, but how, how does this help the country to achieve the, the um, the arrangement as part of the agreement, and what other perhaps surprises for the want of a better description that may have come along. So for instance, um, as part of this agreement as well, the payment system, so it is it's continually being discussed that the arrangement, the agreement with Norway is not kind of like an ODA. It is not a grant. Um, it, it is a service. It's a country that is providing a service and being paid by the other partner. And so how can a, you know, this experience be managed in a way that you don't have you know, the additionalities for compliances that are not necessarily within the original agreement? So in our instance, you have the World Bank um, and you have the IDB who are now, you know, the World Bank is a trustee as part of the arrangement and you have the IDB as well a partner entity who are involved in the process and, and as part, when Norway releases the, the, the payment for the year, it's a kind of an annualized payment. When Norway releases the payment based on the opinion of independent forest monitors, um, you know, and, and says you, you, we've done the auditing, um, we've gone into the country, we've checked based on the reports. Uh, when that money is released by Norway, then the World Bank, bless their hearts, and the IDB um, <laughs> adds uh, you know, oh, but you know, we think that you should also comply with this. And you haven't really made enough progress on this. So, um, you know, we, th there's, a, there's a bit of a hold. Um, and so that can, th that can cause a, a bit of frustration to a certain extent um, and kind of affect some expectations. Um, but to a certain extent, you understand where these international you know, partners are coming from. So how do we strike the balance? I think that's, that's one of the interesting aspects to me that we have experienced in the country. Great, thank you, sir. Just one more final question for you before we move on. And I'm sorry, I haven't really prepped you for this one, but um, if you think about Red Plus as a model that has a certain theory of change that is driving it, there's some assumptions about the model, assumptions made in the model, that there are some things, some incentives mm -hmm. and some principles that are incorporated that will make it uh, a transformative um, framework. Um, you've touched on a few of those in your presentation, so you've spoken about this idea of incentives-based payments, um, but also the principles of equity and participation as core parts of the model. I was just wondering if you could give some reflections about how um, these 
principles and theories have played out and whether you believe that they are going to lay the groundwork for sustainable or transformational change within your context and if not why not again i don't know where to start there's so many things happening in guyana at the, at, at, at the current moment but um going back to the the the, the context I, I i gave you at the beginning um, i did not mention that one of the greatest contributors to our, our GDP is gold mining, and mining in particular. Um, and when you compare the earnings and the contribution to the economy from mining compared to what the country has earned and can earn through you know, arrangements with, with our international partners, there is this, this, this case of how can we really have that transformation that moves from the business as usual um, where you have, oh, but I'm, uh, you know, our sector is really contributing a larger um, share than perhaps, and, and we are more guaranteed in, in terms of the contribution to the economy than, well, what guarantees do you have to have another agreement? What else is out there on, on the international scale? So those are, those are aspects that um, we have been trying to, you know, balance and manage as, as we progress. The other aspect um, now is that since 2015, um, there has been a very large discovery of oil and gas off Guyana's shore. So that kind of puts kind of a spanner in the works uh, because it is a, a totally kind of paradigm shift, a, a new dimension that was not really considered um, as part of this process. The extent of that reserve is huge. Um, I was reading, I mentioned to my colleagues, yes, I was reading a, a, a reference uh, from, from the Bloomberg report, which referenced the kind of flows that Guyana can derive from its oil reserves to be like drinking water from a fire hose. So kind of like a lot more <laughs> that, that, that you can take on. And so while we talk about you know, the, how you know, the incentives can work and equity and so on, I think one of the things that we're, we're also trying to grapple with and to prepare ourselves for is how can we maintain these transformations that we have achieved, the process, the progress that we have achieved in this new dimension. I think that is that that um, kind of you know presents a larger consideration that normally we would not have had when we started this engagement with C4 and this project. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We might come back to Patricia to discuss similar issues. So in your experience, you began to touch on this in your earlier presentation, there's already been some significant challenges that Brazil is experiencing, despite being able to demonstrate that you are achieving the reductions and being able to attract those payments. What are some of the challenges that you're experiencing? But also, what are some of the things that have supported Brazil to get to the point where they are? Thank you. Uh, I think, as all other countries, uh, the implementation of Red Plus in Brazil has positive and also negative aspects. But uh, I also think Brazil has learned a lot during this process. But um, as also is shown in, the, in our research, like one of the biggest problems in Brazil is about coordination and interaction among sectors, uh, mainly among agriculture, mining, energy. Also, the alignment between subnational policies with uh, under the national umbrella. Another issue is participation. Is uh, in the country continue to be uh, implemented like a top-down uh, decision-making process. And uh, another big issue is to tackle uh, the deforestation drivers. One of the the reasons is because. The, the larger uh, landowners in Brazil are also uh, the biggest part of the political arena. So the decision makers are the own who owns the land and are benefited uh, from the uh, economic uh, land uses. And so in your estimation, uh, how given all of those factors, um, how, how confident are you that some of the progress that Brazil has observed is going to be sustainable in the longer term? I think what is positive in Brazil is that Brazil is uh, working with Red Plus under the logic of a public policy that try to compensate who actually is, try, uh, is trying uh, towards uh, forest conservation. 
but uh, how confident I am, <laughs> this is difficult to say because I think the country at this moment is facing like a really political crisis. We have elections in October and this is difficult to know which directions uh, we are going. And also since this uh, new first code in 2012, uh, the, um, like the environmental arena in Brazil is really weakened in the moment. So it seems that uh, it will be really complicated for Brazil to comply with, to be in line with uh, the climate targets and uh, to really achieve sustainable development or be a sustainable country or to, to protect uh, the forests. Okay. Um, thank you to both of you. Those are some really interesting reflections on uh, even when you've made some very significant progress and you've been able to establish a system and attract investment. It's a reminder that we are subject to very dynamic circumstances and some very significant external drivers that can um, have a real, really big impact on how it is that those systems are managed. Um, I might uh, pass over to our colleagues from Peru. Um, Tavia, when you're reflecting on Peru's experience so far, what are some of the things that have enabled you to, to make the progress that you have, but also complicated that? Uh, as I said, we have like readiness implementation and result-based payment at the same time. That means that we have like a national approach, but also a project approach. I think one and some of these projects are like with uh, verify carbon standards and climate community and biodiversity alliance standards. They are like the this project started like six maybe eight years ago, and this is very very good because we the projects. Uh, permit that some people like the um, how do you say that like capacity building process to manage some software like a uh, dynamic and some software to to develop the MRB system, but just in a in a project levels. The challenge is how we can match the national process with the project process because the the, the reference level is, is it's hard to match to match it. Um, uh, I can say good night because in Peru it's like 12 hours of difference. Despite of that, we have the same problems, like the coordination problem between mine, mining, transport, agriculture. It's like it's the same. It's the same problem in, in all the countries. For that, I I think like C4 uh, global comparative study and this kind of platform is like uh, allow us to share our problem because. Sometimes we feel like wow, we have like a big problems in our country, and are the same problems. We we think like share our knowledge, like easy to find a, a better solution. And and I, I think another important thing is like we we are working like in a flexible process, like learning by doing in in Peru, and. In the past, when we talk about red, always talk about grants like World Bank, IDB. It's like, like free money, you know, it's grant. But nowadays, like uh, the the forest investment program is fifty million dollar, and one fifty percent of that is is grant, and the fifty percent part is loan. That means that we we have to pay, and that's that is interesting because some new stakeholder like. Um, um, economic and finance minister start to ask what red means, no? And we have a new, a new, a new player in the arena. And um, economic and financial minister is a key stakeholder because it's the the um, focal point uh, for like the green climate fund. No. Just before we pass that on, I'm just curious to explore that a little bit further. So if you've got these new players coming in, has that been something that has pushed the momentum for RED, or is that making it more complicated? Mm, I need a ball to see the future, I don't know. <laughs> I feel it's in interesting when new uh, stakeholders uh, enter and start to talk about RED, because in fact, RED is like a new name to call 
sustainable forest management. You know, in the negotiation, they create every week new words to, to negotiate, but it's like in the, in the roots, it's like sustainable forest management. You know, I think it's, it's interesting because I, I said like 56% um, of our country's forests and just contribute with 1% of the GDP. Like we need like use better our natural resources. And mining is like 35% uh, of the GDP. How we, can, when, how we can change in the process to use natural resources because we know that gold is like, we, we don't have gold forever. It's like And are there insights that you've seen in the experience of setting up Red Plus that might provide some guidance and some insights in how to um, develop those natural resources in a more sustainable man manner? Are there some transferable policy lessons, I guess, that you've been able to see from within the, the Red Plus study that might inform some of those processes? Mm. I think one of the key actors that is very important is the, the private sector. Who, who is private, private sector here? Can we raise the, the hand? Private sector? Where is the private sector? <laughs> when we talk about red, always ask, where is the private sector? I, I work in a consulting company. I can raise my hand because I am private sector, but I feel, I feel alone. <laughs> I think one of the challenge is how we can include private sector in the in the arena because they they are, but when because you know the the um, the people if you if you study the the deforestation drivers, the private sector is, is part of the drivers always because it's about it's about money, you know? and I think we we have to to develop a special strategy to introduce private sector in the, in the red arena. Yeah, thank you. That's a really timely reminder. A, a colleague has recently shared with us some graphic illustrations of how much investment is going into the Amazon basin and how much of that is public sector money versus private sector money. And then of that public sector money, mm -hmm. how much of that is actually red plus related. Yeah. I and mean, it's a minute amount. So I guess that's the real importance and interest in uh, highlighting what are the transferable lessons that we can take from this to inform um, strategies beyond just the implementation of Red Plus. Thank you very much. Um, Thuy, do you want to speak to us from the Vietnam experience? Um, what have been some of the, the things that have enabled the progress to be made within Vietnam and some of the, the challenges that you've experienced as well? Um, yes, um, I think that in Vietnam we had a quite unique political context and also government region. Um, and I think that one of the major um, and key important factors that make all of the thing with Red Plus possible is a political will and, and government commitment to it. Because if you're looking at the drivers of deforestation and de degradation um, in Vietnam, most of it related to actually the national development goal. Because it's actually our, um, um, there was a lot of inconsistencies among different policy. Because, for example, on the one hand, you have the national commitment on Red Plus uh, to reduce deforestation and degradation. And last year, the Prime Minister also announced the national ban on logging, and we totally closed our forests um, uh, throughout the countries. At the same time, we still have the sector development strategies. For example, we have to maintain our uh, coffee sector as the second largest coffee producers in the world. We also have the national development goal to be um, one of the top three or five on dry exporters and agriculture commodity exporter. Then all of the inconsistent among different policy pose a significant challenges for Red Plus. Um, but I think that like a few years ago, when we observed and doing a lot of studies on Red Plus and other um, uh, forestry policies in Vietnam, it's actually very sensitive to talk about the underlying drivers of deforestation and degradation, because the state agency was actually behind of the drivers, not the small holder and individual uh, indigenous communities who are blamed on doing uh, sweeten and, and sitting cultivation. But I, I said earlier, um, the fact that in the revised national red plot strategy last year, 
um, the government acknowledge the drivers of deforestation and have the policies and measures uh, proposed to address those drivers, I think that was one of the significant changes. Uh, at least there was some shift in the paradigm and also you know, the government views on if they really wanted to commit to reduce deforestation, what has to be included in their policy in the first step, yeah? But also, um, while we are moving ahead with Red Plus, uh, in Vietnam, uh, not just only the political agenda and also the uh, national development goal can influence the whole uh, feasibilities of Red Plus. Within the forestry sector per se, we have um, many new policy initiatives. And the question is whether or not Red Plus should be the government priorities also uh, put on the table and, and um, receive a lot of discussion from the government. Uh, and apparently, uh, the, one of the reasons why the political commitment and interest on Red Plus has been reduced over time, because at the same time, we have the domestic policies, payment for environmental services, where they had a fully command and control system and you know, kind of run by the government. And um, uh, every year, we generate about 150 million US dollars just with our own domestic policy. And in contrast, where you comply with a lot of requirement, international requirement, and you're expecting a lot from Red Plus, but Vietnam has not received any uh, payment from the donor. And obviously, comparing between the domestic policies where you can take a full, uh, you know, operationals and generate already or, or demonstrate already some effectiveness versus the Red Plus where you will have to comply a lot with international requirement but very uncertain futures on the potentials of benefit. And uh, last year, the government, uh, during one of the national workshops that we host together with the government, it made it very clear that Red Plus will not be the political priorities and concern of the governments of Vietnam. Um, so in the context like this, um, but I think that for the last few years, we observed many positive changes in Vietnam as well. Because the, in the past, in, in 2012, we carry our study on safeguards and, and, and free prior informing consent and ethic. And basically, at that step, uh, the government almost didn't want to talk about that. And ethics and indigenous rights um, were treated as one of the most sensitive issues in our debate. And um, uh, for a moment, many uh, researchers and also um, particular uh, there was a great deal you of know, concern from, from Norway and also from many donors about the fact that we didn't tackle into that kind of indigenous people and, and um, equity aspect. But uh, over the time, uh, I think that with a lot of consultation, with a lot of um, you know, exchange and also with a lot of awareness raising, it was very um, great to see that last year with our uh, forestry law revision, it the very first time that indigenous and, and community rights were mentioned in our forest law, which is um, also showing a little bit of change in terms of policies and also political views. Yep. Thank you. You touched on some really interesting issues there in raising the, the dimensions of power and also that um, complementarity, but also tensions between nationally driven processes and internationally driven processes. I'm sure that they will all get picked up on and discussed further. I might move on to um, hearing from Ibu Moira about the, the Indonesian experience. Um, if, would you like to discuss some of the, the drivers and constraints that you've observed in the Indonesia context? Okay, Indonesia uh, RADD started at a time when there was a realization of uh, that the underlying causes of deforestation are beyond the forestry sector. So the first task forces and the red agency really did a multi-stakeholder and had a, a national strategy. But when it was put back in the box, it became a, a forestry uh, issue. So all these uh, external drivers then are beyond the control of the department of the Minister of Forestry to uh, actually uh, I wouldn't say tackle, but uh, there are uh, contextual issues which make the implementation of RDD uh, more complicated than uh, it was when it was uh, a more general issue. For example, uh, at the time when uh, RDD became uh, within the Ministry of Forestry, so a forestry issue, uh, there is also the uh, new law on re-centralization re of, and as this especially affects the forestry sector, 
because it was at the district level, now it's pulled back to the provincial level. So all this, this uh, earlier talk of where RDD should be located uh, is now up in the air again, because this law, although it was uh, issued in 2014, has still not been completely implemented. At the same time, there is a new law on uh, village autonomy. So now villages have the right to, uh, to manage their assets. And the discussion is, is forest in the village territory an asset of the village? Officially, legally, it's still uh, for Ministry of Forestry. So it's legally, it's a state forest. But in the practice, there are all these people living in the forest. So do they have the right to manage their forest or not? So uh, then there is also the agenda on agrarian and forest tenure reform which led to the big program of social forestry. Social forestry is not an, uh, an acknowledge of rights. It's more or less a small concession because it, you uh, request rights to manage and you are given the rights to manage under a lot of requirements. So uh, some groups of people do not really want to accept the social forestry program because it doesn't really <coughs> accept their rights. At the same time, there is also uh, a new law a new instruction that uh, indigenous communities territory are recognized, which is uh, theoretically about 40 to 60 million hectare of the 90, 90 million hectare of forest. But in the practice only uh, so far, I think 16 community uh, communities have been recognize that they have the right to their territories. So all these other millions are still in dispute. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, attention on rights of local communities. Uh, there is also attention of forest. So the Department of Interior Affairs and the Department of Finance uh, are now uh, involved in in talks about forestry, they have a separate section which really uh, ha tries to help coordinate issues on forestry. Like, uh, how do you integrate forestry affairs in the na in the local uh, planning system? So it was because of the dispute where who is actually managing the forest, who has the right, and who has the authority. Local governments uh, have often not not have. Local governments do not have the interest to govern uh, forests because it's, uh, after all, the central government is responsible. So now they are trying to make local governments more responsible. And in this case, uh, it is at the provincial level. Uh, another complication is, of course, the uh, forest management units, which is a new in, uh, construct which is supposed to manage the forest at the, at the site level. But where is this located? At the district level or at the provincial level? Now it's somewhere hanging in between because the decision is still made at the central level. So there is this 90 million hectares of forest estate uh, officially gazetted or maybe a, a large area of that is gazetted as forest estate for which the uh, Minister of Environment and Forestry is responsible. But there's all these other layers in between who are not responsible, but uh, are there using the forest or influenced by the forest. So uh, this question then becomes very difficult because then where is, should red be located? Should, be, should it be managed through the Minister of Forestry like it's now set in law? or should it also be devolved to uh, the local go uh, government? Then uh, 90 million hectare of uh, official forest estate, but there is uh, also a debate, a discussion, or a discourse of what is actually uh, forest and what is, uh, uh, and whether uh, REDD then should also uh, be aligned to the new definition. And it's not settled yet, but there was a question saying, is all that is green now in Indonesia forest, including, um, I don't know how many million of oil palm, 
And the new regulation on RDD at the Ministry of Forestry actually says all, uh, all uh, land covered by forest. And we still do not really know whether the forest is then defined according to law, uh, like what is said now. Forest is an area covered by trees designated by the Ministry of Forestry as forest, or is it the biological unit of land covered by forest, or is it the, the backyards of people where they have planted forest as their, uh, as their safety box, because uh, selling a tree when your child is going to school has always been traditional uh, a way of ensuring your future. So there's all these questions. On the one hand, threat is still there. It's still being discussed. It's still being developed. On the other hand, there's all these other developments going on. So we don't know where it's going. <laughs> Hope for the best. Thank you. manage it is all very key and common I think we've heard across a number of the the country contexts thank you um, yeah would you like to discuss some of the the challenges and um, enabling factors that you have even in this readiness stage what has created the momentum for um, the investment and development of the um, preparation in red plus so far yeah, we have uh, some some of the issue that uh, to implement the red plus in the in the readiness phase also. So one of the issues is coordination issue among the relevant stakeholder, especially in the relevant ministry. So it make the red plus progress slow, and then yeah, the inconsistency of the red plus focal person in each ministry. So is the changing of the focal person or it is difficult to continue to the decision making process or they just they stay new? Uh, and then the, the deforestation in Reagan Myanmar is 1.7% uh, according to the FI 2015, uh, especially in the agriculture sector. And it is not, not agriculture sector, the driver is not uh, under the forestry sector and outside the forestry sector. So we need to negotiate with the another ministry in order to address this kind of the driver. So there is the <coughs> issue. And then currently many robust projects are c implementing uh, forest department and, and other donor country and then NGO and CSO, uh, the robust project are implementing. Uh, uh, most of the robust projects are sponsored by the Indonesian donors, so there is no private involvement in the robust. So, uh, so in the uh, we we uh, we form the robust task force. For well, the first <coughs> time, we invite all of the line ministry. After that, uh, according to their recommendation, we invite the uh, second uh, task force meeting. We also invite the robust focal person in each uh, robust project from the NGO and the Forest Department as well in order to provide the guidance and cooperation among the robust project. But that, that does hold, we also invite the other NGO and CSO project, there are many projects, in, in order to uh, uh, know that what they are going on and in line with the mission uh, roadmap, robust roadmap. So in the fall, uh, task force will be in June, so that time we will invite the private sector and then they will become uh, the member of the robust task force. So maybe that stuff from that time, the private sector might be involved in the uh, robust. So and then we we have a task force. After the, uh, above the task force, we have a national environmental uh, conservation and climate change committee. There is a ministry level, so we also uh, report that what is the robust is going on to the ministerial level, another uh, for the line ministry. And then we have uh, we also made a commitment in the NDC that to extend the uh, forest area up to thirty percent, uh, thirty percent of the uh, result forest, and ten up to ten percent of the Protected area, uh, area system will be extended up to 10% of the total land area. So currently, that is just only the around 30%, but we will uh, extend the 40%. So there is a commitment from the forestry sector. 
So in the NDC, we commit only the forestry sector and the energy sector. So it means that in, uh, in order to address the climate change and the Myanmar, commit just only the forestry sector and the energy sector. So forestry sector play the important role in the NDC. Uh, and then, yeah, after the Paris Agreement, yeah, we have uh, some policy changes. Uh, we have uh, uh, Forest Department issued the login ban start from uh, 2016 to 2017, the whole year, uh, uh, for, for the whole country, just one year. So, car and then the Bago region, that is the high deforestation area. So we, lo we issued the login ban for the 10 years, start from 2016 to 2026. And then, uh, we initiated the reforestation program, Myanmar Reforestation and Rehabilitation Program for 10 years, start from 2016 and 2020. So in the reforestation program also, we uh, not only the reforestation, but also the uh, assisting the nature regeneration and then yeah, other uh, forest related activity in order to increase the forest cover. Uh, and then we also made an amendment the forest law, now this draft is complete, but it's not the finalized yet. Uh, so the uh, we think that the illegal logging is the one of the driver of deforestation. So uh, the in the forest law, there is a week in like a punishment. There is the forest law is uh, issued in the two, uh, 1992. So maybe but the punishment the like uh, in terms of the uh, uh, finance, I mean like uh, is quite low. So it, because of that, maybe the illegal cutter is not uh, respect to the forest law, so maybe that, that's why we amend the forest law. Uh, but it's not yet an uh, issue, but just this draft uh, finish. And then we also uh, uh, do the community forestry instruction, we amend that. That one also issue in the two th uh, 1995, but now, yeah, in order to fit with the current situation, so we revise it. So now we have a many initiated and for the Robles <coughs> UN Red program is uh, uh, start from the 2016 and 2020. There is a phase one preparation of the four element. After the 2020, we will have a phase two, like a same demonstration activity in some area and yeah. So we have a commit. We also commit in the NDC, and then many initiated in stuff after the 2016. And so uh, we hope that Raplas will be a more active in the future. Thank you. Great, thanks. So there's been a, a transition in some of the policy priorities within the country that's really raised some of these issues yeah. to a to a higher level of prominence nationally combined with the international processes and the commitments that Myanmar's made to NDCs have been sort of crucial in creating the momentum towards um, having a readiness in place. Great, thank you. Um, finally, um, from Ethiopia, um, what have been some of the, the things that have driven success so far and also constrained some of the achievements? Okay. Thanks so much. So I think it's better to start with some of the strategies, the developmental strategies that my uh, country, that Ethiopia is doing so far. My country already developed the climate resilient green economy strategy since 2011. And this one is starts to be conducted at the sectoral level and the government give an, an interesting, just give an interesting attention to the, that of the forestry sector. And the different sectors or the different pillars who are going to implement this CRG strategy are divided into four. The first one is agriculture, the second one is forestry, the third one is energy, the fourth one is that of the industry, transport, and the buildings. So the forestry sector is getting an interesting attention from the government. Besides, in order to implement this strategy, the government, uh, besides that of the green growth in transformation, in the growth in transformation plan, the second one, that is the second one, which was starting in 2015-16, and which is going to finalize in 2020-21. So in that phase, the government plan to plant uh, by reforestation and forestation activity in to increase the uh, size of the forest area from 15.5 million hectare when it was started in 2015. Currently, the forest size is about 
million hectare of land is in Ethiopia. It is already covered by the forest. So to increase from 15.5 during that study was conducted into 2015 to 20%. So which implied that the government has just already has a high interest in this forestry sector. And in 2013, the uh, Minister of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, by the way, the forestry sector was in the Minister of Agriculture and Natural Resources. However, just separating the forestry sector from Minister of Agriculture, so there is an independent institution. The Minister of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change established in 2030. And in this Minister of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, there is a Rare Plus Secretariat. And Rare Plus Secretariat is in order to you know, do uh, the readiness phase, doing a lot of stuff in order to uh, come to the finalization stage of this readiness steps. Capacity building stuff, uh, just opening of different coordination units in different subregions like Tigray, Amahara, Southern Nation Nationality, and Oromia. And also, currently, it is planned to open the Ray Plus coordination unit in the Bain Shang Ukraine. So we're going to have five coordination units in Ethiopia. So we can see that Ethiopia has, you know, a high interest in these forestry issues. Um, in the CRG strategy, it is seriously put it that the, one of the great emitters in the country, by the way, agriculture and forestry are the great contribution for the carbon dioxide emission. Uh, forestry from forestry it is seven percent and from Agriculture, it is about 50% of greenhouse gases it is emitted, and from 13% it is from the industry, transport, and the other stuff, because the country is in the developing country. So in the CRG strategy, is also it's planned that by afforestation, reforestation activities, believe that the country is going to reduce this uh, carbon dioxide emission by 50%. It's expe expected a lot of things from this forestry sector. So. We can see that there is a lot of initiation by the government to you know, develop this forestry and rare plus issue. So the other interesting issue uh, from my country is that, that of the issue of social forestry or participatory forest management issue. So this participatory forest management was um, just established 20, 20 years back by that of the NGOs, uh, by Farm Africa and SOSL. And there was, there was an interesting, th there Activities was conducted in the Oromia region, that is in the Bali Eco region, which is consists of greater than half a million hectare of land. So before the government identifies, before the government identifies and knows, appreciate the issue of this community forestry stuff, this NGOs was implemented that. So from the revision of the new forest proclamation, as I said before, just the government the ownership of the forest was given to state and private. So as my colleague from Peru said that the, you know, the activities of the private sector in Ethiopia is not as much. And still, the ball is, as I said, the ball is in the hands of the government. It was. However, in the revised forest proclamation, the government wants to include the community foresters and also the association foresters. So I think it is one of the breakthroughs in the forestry sector for in the future because the government include these community developers and association forest developers by giving some incentives. They can sell their carbon, you know, they, they can benefit. They give a carbon tenure right, they all the, the right and the certification, right by the way, there was no any certification that was, there is no land title given to the community foresters. The land was just given as assigned by state and assigned to the state and private. So I think these are some of the breakthrough and some of the works which are conducted regarding the forestry sector in my country. Thank you. Um, I, I might leave that discussion there for the moment, but there's plenty there that we can follow up with in the discussions after the break. I'd, I'd like to thank each of our, our panelists for their insights and reflections. And I think it's quite interesting that despite the fact we come from very, very different country contexts, there are actually some fairly significant similarities in both the enabling factors and the constraints that you're all experiencing. You know, some of the, the common enabling factors that we touched on there were things like the, the necessity of political will and commitment. Um, uh, 
the requirement or the, the value of having multi-stakeholder engagement involving private sector and also um, successfully integrating multi-levels of governance in, uh, in addressing some of these issues um, and the importance of deliberately investing in capacity to support the implementation of some of these um, changes, these policy developments. Um, before we move on to the, the coffee break, which is coming up quite shortly, I, I'd like to invite one of our um, colleagues and long-term collaborators on this uh, research project, um, Professor Maria Brockhaus, who is uh, currently the Professor of International Forestry Policy at Helsinki University, to just provide some reflections and comments on, on what you've heard so far this morning. Thank you very much, Bethany. Good morning, everybody, or good noon, one could say as well. Super honor to be here. Now I have one minute and the honor to kind of putting in a nutshell what you guys all were all saying mm -hmm. and to summarize the research we have done over the past decade on Red Plus comparatively across the globe. I'm shaking a little bit because that's such a big task. But perhaps the first thing I want to start with is by basically standing here and saying we are in the honeymoon phase. If we look at the early beginners, the Red Plus beginners, it's still honeymoon. People happily flock together under this umbrella of Red Plus because <coughs> the conflicts start when you start to talk about policies and measures. Mm -hmm. And they really get hard when you talk about results-based finance. Mm -hmm. And that has something to do with power and politics that are really challenging. And these political struggles we heard from all of you, I think, in your contributions right now, but we also see in our comparative research. And these political struggles are, of course, not unexpected because deforestation is driven very strongly by vested interests that are very established and that have a lot to do with the private sector. Perhaps you had not in mind as you were calling for the private sector, but that is very prominent and very much entangled with interest within bureaucratic systems, also something we heard, for example, also from Brazil, these struggles around the forest code. So perhaps the private sector is already in the room even without waving their hand when you ask for it. So political power struggles, and then I found very fascinating and concerning also that this kind of a red plus idea has been pushed back into a little box, which is a project box, which is perhaps a forest sector box, even though everybody knows you cannot tackle deforestation within the forest sector because it's driven by drivers beyond the forest sector. So what does that mean if it gets pushed back in this little box? What does that tell us? Is that part of this political struggle, perhaps also to really undermine efforts to halt deforestation? And Red Plus is not the first effort that has been undertaken to halt deforestation. So it seems it gets really hard the moment where you move out of this very easy to see technical changes and really progress that is possible in this capacity area when you move into policies and measures implementation where we then really see that it hurts perhaps those interests that really don't want to change. And that moves me also out of this kind of domestic, red is not a domestic problem as such, it's not a problem of forest rich countries. Who benefits from deforestation? Who are those that benefit? And who are those that keep investing in activities that drive deforestation? So while this is all somewhat depressing, I think what we also heard is there are new coalitions. These technical advances have brought new information that can help civil society, which I think came also through here, to really hold state and private sector that made commitments a bit more accountable. But that makes investments, and I hope here in the room is civil society. Who is civil society? Research, by the way, is civil society as well. <laughs> Thank you. I think this makes it so important, and that gives all of us also a responsibility, I think, to engage in this process and contribute to holding accountable states, countries, forest-rich countries that committed in their NDCs. But also, I think, and me myself coming from the north also, coming from Germany, living now in Finland since one year and a half, Hello, the, who benefits again is the question. So holding accountable, I think Norway did that very interestingly. And that is this kind of Norwegian pension fund, if I'm not mistaken, where they realized on the one hand we invest big time into 
supporting deforestation. On the other hand, we are investing in private sector activities and benefiting from that in that drives deforestation. So they kind of revised, but only because civil society was pushing for that, they revised their investment strategies. This is homework for countries beyond the forest-rich countries that are sitting here. And I think that's very important, this whole accountability stuff as a way forward. And my last point, and then I stop, and I think I've used my two minutes, but um, I would like to challenge not only Javier, but perhaps nearly everybody in this room, because we are using the term private sector so lightly. Who is that? I think you are talking about green investors. I'm talking about deeply vested interests driving deforestation. My private sector is looking very different than yours. My private sector looks a little bit like the private sector Patricia meant that was very busy with the Brazilian parliament, I think, in 2011-12. And I think we have to be more specific when we talk about private sector. I think it's a myth to think that the private sector is not in the room. And I'm saying that based on many years of research where we looked at who is speaking and representing what interests. And what we found is that, which is also the role of the state, of course, to some extent, state actors do represent business interests. And living in <coughs> Finland, the whole development agencies, ministries are representing home countries' business interests. I'm not sure if there are any representatives here from donor countries, for example, or payment countries, but this is a reality. And I think we have to be very careful when we use this term private sector. And I do think that this wave of calling for the private sector, who seems to be not in the room, is a total illusion. Yes, the private sector is in the room, and that's something that has to get out. We need transparency, and we need specificity about who is this private sector. And with that, I stop and I could go on and on, <laughs> because it's 10 years of comparative research with all of you guys, so really an honor to be here. Thanks so much, Maria, for weaving those threads together and also laying down those challenges. We look forward to exploring some of these ideas with all of you here after our coffee break. Um, we're going to conclude the first half of this forum here. We'll have a coffee break quite quickly, if we don't mind, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll reconvene. And over that time, please feel free to um, approach our panel and uh, get some contact details to follow up further. I'll speak to you all again in about 10 or 15 minutes. And the in involvement and inclusion of, of these multi-stakeholders must go beyond participation in meetings and sharing information like that. They must be involved in the decision-making process. Um, so it must be true engagement, and also those persons who are representing their various constituencies, whether you come from private sector, indigenous communities, or you know, wherever, that, that those persons must have the ownership and responsibility to report to their constituents, so that they truly represent their constituents um, you know, and keep them informed. Um, the process of ident identifying those stakeholders and stakeholder representatives is important. Um, and so you need that kind of scoping process, for the want of a better description, to identify who are the stakeholders, who needs to be engaged, who um, is involved, and ensure that the process works truly for the benefit of all. Thank you. I know that there's been some interesting multi-stakeholder initiatives functioning in Brazil at the sub-national level. I'm not sure if Patricia is in a position to comment on those, but I might throw to you yourself and then to Peru. And yeah, as Vanessa said, uh, mood stakeholder uh, is really important. Um, in Brazil, like the sub-national uh, level, they are invited to participate also inside the federal level. There are like the National Commission on Red Plus uh, where they have a place uh, to talk. But uh, still, uh, there's some deficiencies, uh, as I said before, but also not only about the stakeholders, also about uh, uh, the levels, and you can find synergies. The problem is to apply this in the long term. So usually, uh, such uh, platforms are applied only in the short term. 
and this makes the, the implementation of the Red Plus process uh, difficult. And just before you move on, um, Patricia, the, okay. you said that they often work in the short term but not the long term. Why is that? Is that because they're a, a donor-driven or a projectized um, kind of intervention or why are some of the reasons they haven't endured? Yeah, it's uh, like you're saying, because to change the political process is really difficult. So such measures will be only applied in the short term because, um, and these also take time. You, you have to, it's a long process. To, to implement uh, a policy so, so, uh, as Red Plus uh, is not from today to tomorrow. So in, in doing this process, you have many changes, as in our case, the government change. So they have other priorities. They try to do other things, and this is put behind. Other things are uh, come first. And so this um, gets in, uh, in the middle of the process. Thanks, Javier. I think the, the multi-stakeholder commitment, I believe that participation is not the final objective, it's just a part of the process to have a better governance in our, in our forest. In our experience as a consultant company, we help some like banks and insurance company to, to, to have the GSG inventory and then we show that they can be like a neutral carbon and it's very, very interesting when you teach to the CFO or CEO uh, how Red Projects works. Like, you know, the, the CEO of the company start to ask if, if they can like uh, uh, neutralize the, the carbon footprints. And sometimes when the company is very interesting, we invite the company to, to, to the field to see the project, to talk with native communities. And I think this, this is a part of the, the process when each company enter in the, in the new arena. And we have like a very, very good experience with one company. And they, they pay like $100,000 for a red project. And then they like create a, a commercial in the TV. And millions of Peruvians see like this company like have the carbon footprints and then they, uh, they are like neutral carbon and the, the, the people, like my mother, start to talk uh, carbon footprints, like neutral carbon footprints, it's a, it's a very good way to, to do business. And another company start to ask, if this bank do that, can I do that? And you know, it's like the participation is, is not the final objective, it's just a part of the process to have a better governance. It was clear. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit about the case studies in Vietnam because in Vietnam we have two parallel multi um, government multi stakeholder forum. One is actually established by the UN Red uh, together with the government of Vietnam under the Vietnam uh, Red Plus network. And basically, we have the multi-stakeholder forum where actually you have the sub uh, technical working group. Um, under the national report network and each of the network you will chair between one of the government agency and another CSO. So if you have a beneficiary mechanism under REPLAST then you have a chairman, a co-chairman, one is from the government and one from the CSO. And actually this model worked pretty well for the first few years from 2012 and 2013 because not just only um, a wide variety of stakeholders was invited in that workshop, but the most important thing is there was a key government agency will be there, and then they actually take into account all of the things stakeholders talk, and then they report back to the party, and then they review the law. But then uh, from 2013 and 2016, you see the decline in the interests of both private sector and also actors in that forum. Because first of all, the government is no longer interested in Red Plus, so they was not there. So even though the stakeholder discuss a lot about the policy issue and they come up with a lot of proposal, nobody actually be there to, you know, kind of take uh, taken it up and then actually transform it into a meaningful outcome. So f even though the activity is ongoing, uh, but basically the whole multi-stakeholder forum kind of deactivates in 2013 now. And uh, the government and also both the state but also the non-state actor 
are not willing to participate in it. We have another multi-stakeholder forum, which is the, the um, Vietnam NGO kind of, uh, network under the FLECTI. And in contrast to the other event, which is donor driven, it was actually established by the national S uh, CSO themselves. And they was actually also doing the same format, inviting many stakeholders from different groups, private sector, international NGO donor come. And that network doesn't require any kind of financial resource to sustain. And then the CSO themselves organize that activities and then they're actually very strong in bringing all stakeholders together and um, pro provide a lot of input for the law revision and they kind of connecting it to the governments. So you see a two parallel initiative and one work very well and the other doesn't. So um, I think that it, it relies a lot on how you structure that multi-stakeholder forum. But also, uh, it's just not only about you go there, but every single one who participated in this forum wanted to see their input uh, can lead to something. A and that the network you know, didn't fulfill their commitment. So in our um, surveys over the time, uh, which is like one of the most disappointment according to the people, uh, is that that multi-stakeholder forum under Red Plus doesn't fulfill its mission, and therefore nobody are interested in it. And in a way, that is very sad, because uh, in terms of the legal framework, this multi stakeholder forum is the only window opportunities that, by law, that CSO are invited, and then you can actually contribute to the policies making. But with the arrangement and with the structures and how it run, yeah, it didn't make to the final way, yeah. Okay, thanks, Tui. Um, I know that it's a slightly frustrating answer to a question, but I would also highlight the fact that there is a, an entire module in this research program that is studying these multi-stakeholder initiatives. So in two or three years, we'd be much better positioned to provide a really um, concise answer to that. But um, I would encourage you to get in touch with Anne Larson and her team and track some of the, the progress around those multi-stakeholder initiative um, studies as well. Um, and the, we might move on to the, the second slightly challenging question we have here about uh, does Red Plus work, full stop. Um, I, I'm going to preface my <laughs> the response by saying I guess it really does depend on how you define red. But given the limitations, um, I, just a very quick response from everyone on the panel. Gut instinct in your country, in your context, would you say that to date, where you are, is Red Plus working? Yeah, actually, Red Plus is not new. It is the mechanism that in order to achieve the sustainable forest management, because the in the Red Plus also Red is a deforestation degradation. So it's trying to reduce the emission from the deforestation degradation and plus activity also the conservation and enhancement of forest carbon stock. So that is uh, not new. Just change the name. So. So I'm, I'm, I would say that Red Plus is working uh, because uh, our country already <coughs> start the forest management system to achieve the sustainable forest management. So, so Red Plus have an incentive mechanism. It is based on the perform performance. So we can get uh, Indonesian support based on our performance. So it means that so Red Plus is not new, so it, it is working. You wanted a simple answer? I don't know, because it's actually not tried yet. Because we are still uh, uh, doing a lot of the definitions, the preparation and so. So in fact, it's not as it is efficient, it hasn't been really tried yet. But I think uh, as an idea, it really works, because it has raised a lot of uh, issues which otherwise would have been buried in the overall discussions. So in the issue of cross say, sectoral issue, by the way, Red Plus without you know participating different stakeholders, Red Plus cannot achieve its objective overall. So in order to achieve its objective, Red Plus must you know must participate different stakeholders who are really who are really relevant for these Red Plus objectives. So in my country, there is, there is cross-sectoral, I mean, the multi-stakeholder are participated in the Red Plus issues and contribute their part to make it sustainable. You know, all the inputs, all those activities, all the results which is obtained by 
the real plans it is going to be presented to all the steering committee and all the necessary partners who are part of the Red Plus Committee. So the second one is that, that the Red Plus work. <laughs> you, you said that it is a simple question, but it is not a simple question, by the way. Yeah. So to say yes, I have to say something, and to say no, I have to put something, but it really needs the government effort to make this happen. You know, to work, the Red Plus to become effective, to become equitable, to become efficient, all the policies it must be okay. All the policies must be, you know, work in the alignment with the sustainable forest management issue. So I'm indifferent <laughs> to say yes and to say no. But the government needs to work more and more to, you know, to uh, improve its policy, which is related to the Red Plus. So it needs some research investigation. I have to say that I love your question. <laughs> I think it's like it, the same question that a hammer works. You can use a hammer to put a nail in the wall, and also you can break someone's head. You know, it, it depends how you use red. And for me, it's like sustainable forest management. I, we, we create electric car, we went to the moon. We can manage the, the forest. It's not too easy. I, mean, I think, yes, red works. <laughs> no, just great. Um, I, yeah, I think that I, I, I will agree with Moira's. At least in Vietnam context, uh, red does work. A lot of things, it doesn't work well. But one of the things it worked very well is because many issues without red it will never be brought up to the table. For example, the topic of indigenous uh, people, you know, transparencies in governance, it will never be uh, giving, given a space to talk about that in many, um, you know, kind of sensitive political contexts. And that is the thing that we should not forget about that. Also, um, I think that based on our research, when we asked the coder uh, since 2011 until now, what have they seen as the biggest achievement on Red Plus and what Red Plus work? And I think that's um, in Vietnam context, the stakeholder divided that the abilities of Red Plus to open up new topics yeah, and also um, contribute directly to the forest governance improvement is one of the things that they see Red work very well. In terms of the impact on forest and people's livelihood, I think that we have an earlier slide. We are based on our preliminary findings from Model 2. Um, uh, on, on the actual impact of whether or not red work to improve forest cover and, and forest qualities and also the local livelihood. And we have some evidence over there. And if you need more information on that subnational level, again, like we would be more than happy to contact you with our college uh, in Medusa. Uh, oh, sorry, I totally agree with Tui because in Brazil, uh, was more or less the same. Uh, such issues as synergies between agriculture and conservation and forestry was never spoken before. And through Red Plus, uh, you have this channel to try to bring uh, such issues together. And uh, this opens uh, a communication be between such sectors and uh, that never have spoke before. Of course, there are some issues that still have to be deal with, but uh, I think depending on your perspective and from this perspective, yeah, uh, Red Plus is working. Love your question. Um, valuable stakeholder question. A lot of times we don't take into consideration skeptics. I'm really glad you asked the question. In the context of Guyana, yes. I'm very happy to tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> she said short answer. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you. So it seems that there's a bit of a consensus that RED has been a, a way of building on some existing knowledge and giving it some real momentum and direction. But there is some, some questions about how it's being used and how it's going to address some of the challenges. But overall, a fairly optimistic response that RED holds some, some real potential to make a difference. I'm going to go back to the audience now. Is there uh, a second round of questions? Yes, gentleman in the middle. Thank you. My name is uh, Zulfira from WWF Indonesia. 
My question is, uh, yeah, from the lesson from the, the Vietnam, yeah, I see that the red now blended into the PES, yeah. Uh, could you tell a little bit more uh, idea behind that and uh, how it will blend into the PES? And the uh, second question is on the, uh, I think the, the Brazil, yeah. I think one of the successful of red implementation in Brazil because of involvement of the indigenous people, yeah, by gazetting their uh, what indigenous people territories, recognizing around that, yeah. Uh, and how do you think uh, if it is uh, the applicability of uh, that uh, approach to uh, other country and what uh, perhaps uh, require? Uh, to make it uh, possible in other countries that also have the uh, indigenous people, something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this point, or should we? Uh, yes, just at the front here. Hi, um, I'm Natalie Campbell from Rights and Resources Initiative. I, um, well, I was curious to hear and, and we're kind of familiar, and some of you mentioned tenure issues. So I'm curious to hear how all of your different country platforms engage with carbon rights within the broader context of tenure issues, um, also within the broader context of payments for results-based services. Um, but I also wanted to ask maybe another uh, broader, harder question to answer which would be, wh what is your opinion on the question, should tenure be a precondition to RED and to RED Plus? Thank you. Uh, those are three fairly juicy questions to get on with. So we have uh, two specific ones, one to, um, directed to Tui about the relationship between uh, RED Plus and the payment for environmental services in Vietnam. Tui, do you want to address that first? Uh, yes, so um, actually let me come back a little bit. Um, in, the, in Vietnam, uh, we had a national payment for forest environmental services way before Red Plus because the national policies on payment for environmental services already established it in 2008. And since 2008 until now, we already developed the whole full system of uh, payment distribution, but also the monitoring evaluation on it, it, it cannot be called a result-based payment like Red Plus, but basically the whole idea is that it's similar context that uh, the service providers can only be paid if they demonstrate that they're doing some good for environmental services. And when Red Plus were first uh, brought up to, to Vietnam case and over the time, the government uh, actually doesn't consider Red Plus as one separate um, national project but it has always been seen as one of the uh, components of the National Payment for Environmental Services. And uh, if you're looking at how the government designing its payment distribution um, at um, with, with Red Plus, it's actually primarily based on the existing payment distribution that the government already developed for payment for environmental services. A and that's how it's actually evolved over time. Um, I think that lies, uh, um, nowadays we have the uh, Red Fund, which is we're supposed to receive all of the payment from donors and also private sector to pay for Red Plus activity. And at the moment, the government has the National Pest Fund and the, uh, the Red Plus Fund, you just a sub account of that one only. And it is still a discussion whether or not you need to harmonize a protocol, because basically with the domestic uh, PFAS policy, you don't have to provide the whole transparency um, and uh, um, external kind of auditor. But with the, uh, the red funds, because it's actually follow the international protocol, um, there was a tension whether or not you know, that actually a lie and, and how it's worked out. But uh, the fact is now, as I said before, we don't have any more uh, red funds because of uncertainties about the funding. And I'm, and I'm still qu not quite sure. But in the law by itself, uh, Red Plus is defined at one type of subcomponent under the National Payment for Environmental Services. Yeah. Thank you. And Patricia, if we're inviting you to share some lessons and insights from Brazil's experience in working with their indigenous territories. Okay. 
So in, in the Amazon, 44% of the Amazon is declared uh, from the Brazilian Amazon is declared as an indigenous territory. What I think is um, to highlight something from the indigenous people in Brazil is that they are quite uh, really organized and uh, supported by the civil society as well. They have fought really hard to be involved in this context uh, of Red Plus, and they even got a place inside the National Commission uh, on Red Plus. So I think this is the differential uh, about indigenous organizations or uh, community in Brazil. Uh, but uh, of course, it's still there is uh, it's still a lot to, to be done in this context there, because even uh, in the last years, there was like uh, an increase uh, of threatening of the human rights from indigenous peoples with an uh, uh, increase of rate of murders and, and death um, because of dispute of, uh, of, of land. So, yeah, I think this is uh, one of the, the aspects why we could be a little bit successful in treating uh, in involving the indigenous people inside the context uh, of red. Great, thank you. I might pass on to Vanessa to have a first go at addressing um, the question in relation to, to tenure and its place in red plus. So how, um, how does tenure relate to carbon rights and whether tenure is a, a necessary precondition, I guess, in a way for red plus? Yeah. Um, so in Guyana, the, the policy um, addressing climate change and going along a, a green um, path has been using the, the forest estate that is considered and is the national patrimony. And so any funds derived from you know, a PES um, have been applied for national benefit. Um, so there's no precondition for um, you know, tenure rights before you can um, benefit from, from the funds earned. However, um, there's uh, this, uh, I think I alluded to it earlier, um, what is referred to in my country as an opt-in mechanism, where the indigenous communities that have title to their lands can derive um, funds, you know, additional funds, so addition, additional benefit um, if they were to include their lands into the, you know, the, um, the, the, the area that is assessed um, for, for deforestation and forest degradation. Yeah. Does anyone else want to address that question of tenure and Red Plus? Um, Monica, did you? Uh, in Indonesia, uh, in the beginning, carbon rights was really tied to red plus. But then the issue of tenure itself is so complicated that by now we forget to talk about carbon, carbon rights. Also because carbon rights are then tied to the trees and trees are from the state forest estate so the state will have uh, the right to it. But uh, there is, uh, in the RDD discussion itself, tenure is uh, put as a precondition to red because it's basically who is, again, who, is, who will be responsible in the end. So the government can say it's all state forest land, but unless they sort out the tenure issues, nobody will actually be responsible. So then if nobody is responsible over land or the forest on it, then nobody can actually implement RDD. So that is basically the issue. So unlike Guyana, we, we don't really have indigenous communities already having title, although we are talking to it. But unless we sort that out, there is still going to be dispute on and on and on. So in, in Ethiopia, the issue of carbon rights, the issue of carbon tenure is it's integrated in the new forest proclamation again. And the government, that's what I said you before, there the government divided the ownership right into four, the private states, community and association. And the government starts to give the carbon right, the carbon right in land incentive or land title, which was not there in the previous period. So the carbon tenure issue is it is coming to consideration by the UN government in the carbon tenure. You know, when if somebody has the land, so the benefit it is not only from the tree but the 
people start to, starts to gain this carbon, the income from the carbon. So the carbon tenure issue is very important. So the second question is carbon tenure issue. Tenure should be a precondition for it. Plus, I think it's yes, yes. People, you know, in order in order, in order to invest much of your time with this red plus issue, you have to gain something. So the benefit of gaining something, it is not from, you know, from not the trees, but carbon plus non-carbon benefit must be benefited from the tree. So the carbon tenure issue, it must be the precondition for red plus achievements, I think so. It's my opinion, actually. Precondition. Mm. I believe when, when a baby starts to, to walk, the precondition is you know it's going to fall. I think the right process is, is, is the same. It's like learning by doing. If, you, if we want to design like a perfect process for red, we, we, we never can try if it, it works. I think we have to try and in the process, we, we are like modifying the process to, to, to have a, a better. In our case in Peru, we have like like national approach and also project approach, and that means that uh, we use like international protocols like verify carbon standard and they you know, they check the salvaguards and all, all, everything and work very very well. I think that in Vietnam it was similar to in Vietnam uh, when we first had the discussion on red plus the carbon right topic is very hot and is almost in central discussion in every meeting that we have. But soon realizing how complex it is and you know the mismatch between different type of tenure system and the complex within even our own law, then the discussion on carbon rights has not been evolved for the last five years, at least in Vietnam. But uh, I think that like, if you wanted to learn more, we have a published paper which actually looking at the carbon right issue and also analyze the political and legal framework in seven countries. Not with some of the countries we are having here, but we would be more than happy to share that paper with you if you are interested. Yeah. Um, I think uh, like if it's a precondition, I'm not sure, but of course tenure is fundamental. Um, because in the end, tenure is totally related with benefit sharing. Yeah. So if you see in Brazil, 27% of the Amazon is still in dispute. So it's really difficult to, to implement such uh, approach as Red Plus in a situation like this. So um, uh, what else? Uh, as the government in Brazil are not trying to deal with Red Plus is, uh, at the, the project level, uh, this makes it even more complicated because then the government is delaying even more and more and more to talk about, uh, to talk about that. They try to implement first, like to, to establish the framework and we don't know when they, <laughs> they would like to talk about that. But um, for example, one of the proposals of the, the civil society in Brazil, and uh, they try to do a system in, in stock and flux uh, of carbon to try to, to, to be like, to find an equity between the federal and the subnational level. But uh, this is only a proposal and is not yet adopted uh, between the Red Plus framework. Yeah, if I if I can just kind of listen to my colleagues, I, it makes me think of, of the approach to Guyana in, in Guyana. So in Guyana, the um, funds that are being derived from you know the PES um, is seen as another income stream into the country's GDP. Just as when we export sugar and we earn from it or timber or whatever, and those earnings are, are for the benefit of all the people. So it, it's the same concept with what is derived from, from um, you know, from red. So land tenure issue is very complicated in Myanmar. Uh, so uh, we, we are revising the land use policy in order to address that, that, that issue. So but yeah, and then because of the REPLUS, we have a many stakeholder consultation meeting in, the, uh, in order to do the safeguard process. 
So that time we addressed the land tenure issue in that time, but but through the consultation meeting, it can be improved. Thank you. Um, Maria, would you like to pose a question or share a comment or a reflection? Excellent. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, just also to comment from a more global perspective, perhaps on this question of um, rights as a precondition to start with Red Plus. I do have to say the first time I think this question was asked that I heard it was 2007 in Bali at every single COP ever since. Maybe tin this question was raised. But actually the issue here I think which also came out of these countries is that actually we have a chicken and egg problem. Red Plus is supposed to bring transformational change as an idea, as a concept, and really change away from business as usual of deforestation. At the same time, it needs major change. So how do you get that? And I think to put one whore, to, to put in there a sequence might be dangerous, as we heard also from Javier from Peru. This baby might be never born and never walk at all. So also one has to say, and I think we forget that here a little bit, we have the Warsaw framework and their safeguards are explicit. Now, the country reality is that the safeguards reporting are very small and very non-satisfactory. So perhaps we have to change these questions and really help. You know, if you want to, it's a country question if you want to do Red Plus, but how to do it equitably needs these kind of points, but not as do you need it as a precondition, but how do you make it good? And how do you realize it within? And I think the Indonesian example flagged a little bit also some other countries that tenure came really to the forefront. And Red Plus enabled this kind of platform to discuss these issues. But making something out of it, seeing this really major change in the governance frameworks for, our, for your forests is, I think, the next step. And that is where, again, these questions might help, but not as a sequence. I would say, let's make this Warsaw framework and the safeguards requirements really strong and alive and not just a notion. Thank you. I'll open up for another round of questions. Are there other questions from the floor? Maybe it's a reflective question. I think um, I've had this question for a long time. How do we make sure that Red Plus agenda targets all the good intentions withstand the different election cycles or different um, government regimes? So um, maybe um, all of you can share what happens with the civil society movement, how united are there in, the f in this front? We are thinking about, for example, here in Indonesia, in approaching um, different candidates or even the electoral committee to make sure that this agenda is in the political debates. It's in the um, debates between candidates, either be it climate change, if you want to make it general, whether it is Red Plus and Forestry. But how do we make sure that agenda stays even we have different politicians or different people in power? Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions at this point? No, well, people are thinking we, we may as well get started on that one. So um, how, do you, how have you seen that we can ensure continuity across political changes and what is the role of civil society in keeping that focus on this transformational change agenda? So this is the key function in taking multiple questions. It gives people a chance to collect their thoughts. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, perhaps I can stick my neck out here. Um, going back to the question um, you asked about um, stakeholders and stakeholder involvement, um, to me, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the context of Guyana, it has built national ownership. Um, so it, not only the political will, because when you think of transitions from one government to the next, um, you know you, you you have the concept of you know will it will it remain within the policy interest um, moving from one political party to the next or one regime to the next. Um, but if you have great um, interest nationally from all the various groups, and 
going back as well in terms of the composition of your, your stakeholder committee, if it also includes um, you know, members of parliament and, and, and persons from political parties, then that helps in the transition. Or at least I can say it has helped in the instance of Guyana um, so far. <laughs> because in the instance of Guyana, you had you know, the president at that time who piloted the low carbon development strategy and this, you know, got to the Norway agreement and was out there, um, you know, advocating and pushing and so on. And then in 2015, you had this transition to a new government, which was not in office, kind of a coalition government, but which was not in office for over 20 years. Um, and so there was a kind of a, you know, kind of a waiting period nationally to see what direction um, the country would take. And the direction we're going to now is that we now have a successor to the low carbon development strategy in the form of the green state development strategy, a lot of terms and acronyms and so on, but along the same pathway. Um, so I, I guess in the instance, to answer your question, in the instance of you know, how do you bridge that transition, it goes back to you know, how, how the civil society organizations and all the various stakeholders, how involved, engaged, interested they are and how they can push. Thank you. And does anybody else want to comment on that one? I, I, I know Peru has gone through multiple changes in government over recent years. Is there something you'd like to add? We have like president election each five years, and each five years our company look for funds to put climate change in the in the arena, and it's very hard because um, one of each three Peruvian live in a city. And they never walk around the forest and don't know nothing about real trees and monkeys. And it's hard to put the, the climate change debate in, in the political arena. And it, I don't know, really, the people doesn't matter about climate change. It's like, and I believe like the, the transformation, transformational change it's like when not just the NGOs and companies talk about climate change and forests, it's when each person when want to buy like a, a table or a chair, ask if this wood is from like sustainable forest management. And I think we are like in we are beginning this process when the people are like the millennials and are more like conscious about the, the environmental impacts and for people who do research i think you have to put like 50 percent of your energy in your re research and the other 50 percent in how you can communicate this to really be useful for the other person because if you put 100 percent of your energy just in the paper it's nobody's going to to, to check it I think even uh, even though with a lot of political uh, instability, uh, for example, not one way, but uh, it could be like one. Yeah, one way is uh, to keep the civil society uh, strong. At the moment in Brazil, uh, that uh, the civil society started like to move uh, themselves and start to push the government to try to deal with climate change and deforestation, uh, things start uh, to happen. And even though it came another government, RED went through this. Uh, that's why we have a RED uh, a decree in a um, uh, national strategy uh, established. But um, what I think also, like uh, under the framework of RED Plus, what was uh, good is because although most of the attention, for example, is paid to the Amazon, we started also to, to look at the other biomes that we have uh, in the country. So, for example, Brazil released in 2017 the reference level for the Cerrado biome. So, uh, I don't know if you read is capable of assure really to 
to bring zero deforestation, but uh, I think it's, uh, we could get there. And the Red Plus uh, discussion is uh, make a lot of differences because we, as we said before, we're talking about uh, issues, we're paying attention in other issues, even like the, the population in Brazil is seeing that we're not only the Amazon. We have other biomes, we have other biodiversity hotspots that should also be protected. Yeah, I think that uh, the forestry sector has, uh, I, I would say that Replus has got more attention in this cover in the new government. Uh, so it is depend on the government transition, of course. But uh, as long as we uh, we uh, suffer from the climate change impact, uh, the government also think about the forestry sector is how important in the climate change. So we suffer from the landslide and then flood even in the uh, capital city. So they think about the how important of the forestry. So it, it could say that Rublas because Rublas also f more focus on the forestry for deforestation. So yeah, so of course I they have uh, many challenges among the other sector if government transition. But as long as I think that as long as we suffer from the climate change, uh, the rubblers can work in Myanmar even and to the government transition. Yeah. Answer from Indonesia. Of course, we have experienced how a change in government has sort of put that back in the box of forestry instead of the multi-stakeholder -stake uh, almost movement it was. But we might learn from the tenure movement because in 1998 there was a call for overall reform in the tenure and by the time it was uh, allowed by the government, there was the Katatapan uh, MPR, uh, the, the, the representative council decision for agrarian reform, the civil so society was not ready. So there was an opening, but civil society was not ready to use that opening. On the other hand, Aman has been pushing for indigenous rights and RDD provided an opening. So it took this opening and it moved its agenda forward. So I guess in order to make sure that our RID or climate change agenda and the tenure reform agenda will survive changes in government. Civil society should stay involved and engage despite the disappointments of, of progress and be prepared. Uh, so we should, we need to understand the changing situations and uh, take the opportunity when it arrives. Are there any other final burning questions from our, our audience? Um, yes, um, a colleague from Myanmar at the back. Uh, thank you very much. I want to follow up about the preconditions for uh, ten land tenure for the web plus. I think it is very important in our country and also uh, land tenure, precondition for land tenure issue is so important to achieve the three e benefits in the future and also to achieve participation, especially for the indigenous people. Even though in our country, national land use policy 2016 recognized the right of indigenous people, at this moment, community forestry is only the legal tenure to recognize the community rights. But for the people who live in the mountainous area, as for example in Chin State, they don't want to uh, establish the community forest. Rather than that legal that tenure, they want to get the another tenure. So for me, I think the diversification of tenure to be in line with the current land use condition is very important. It should be preconditioned for the replas. So I would like to know the our panel's idea from other countries. So the 
the question you're posing to the panel was, sorry, what specifically? The, you would like their reflections on... Do you, Pre sorry? Preconditions. Preconditions for replas. So diversification of tenure is very important to achieve the 3E through people participation. Okay. All right, maybe as a, a final conclusion from each of our panelists, what do you see as being the important um, preconditions or features of, of successful Red Plus? I think we don't have enough time. We have just to, to start and Yes, we have to start and, and try and try and find the best answer. I think it just bring back to me one of the one of the projects that we are doing now with um, Moira Islip on the ASEAN Social Poetry Working Group in, in Vietnam. And I think that like over the time, uh, sometimes the land use rights certificate, at least in Vietnam context, is the document to prove that you have some sort of secure um, ten tenerities and in fact in many Sweden communities where we work they don't want to have that type of land use rights certificate because as you said it didn't come with the benefit because for example in, in, in our countries most of the bare land and degraded land and they are so isolated and it's difficult to assess then the government aside for the Sweden community and now I give you the uh, degraded land and then it's your responsibility to regr regrow and Regreening the land. So actually, from the perspective of many student community, it's a burden rather than a benefit because what can actually you benefit from that land? And also in many communities where we're working with, particularly close to the national park, like um, in the past they are really trying uh, to discuss with the provincial government to give them a piece of land use rights certificate. But when it comes, it's come with so many restrictions. For example, if you have this land, you are not allowed to do so. You cannot go into your own forest and doing, um, you are not allowed to go to your traditional forest and continue doing the practice that you used before. So it's come to the question, maybe like AA asked, you know, whether or not the condition of the tenure uh, security comes, uh, exactly what the local people want. And it is come with just only benefit and rise, but also the burden and a lot of responsibility that may not be exactly what you know the local communities want. So it's a very complex issue, I think. Yeah. Um, what is preconditions for Red Plus? I think one of the most important is political will and really to recognize that deforestation is a problem. So I think also. Uh, to recognize it, to understand that without to use the natural resource in a proper and intelligent way, uh, we're not going to survive. I think it's pretty clear, but uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's difficult, uh, it's only difficult to recognize this. We know the answer, but uh, we know also how to do it, but uh, we don't want to do it, probably. Um, for fear of not repeating myself with regard to the need for tenure, um, tenure rights, in the context of Guyana, um, so our main economic earners and the funds derived from those are used to improve the services and facilities across the country, like any other, um, you know, any other country, and so. Um, and, and the ability to be able to earn that finance um, is, is lies in the responsibility of the government and the regulatory agencies to ensure the, nece the necessary policies and enforcement and so are in place. Um, but not having um, title to the land does not preclude you from being able to derive benefits. I mean, to, to also think of what benefits are you talking about. If it's benefits that you get cash that you put in your money, in your, in your pocket, or if it's a benefit that you know, improves um, other aspects, your livelihood and so on. Um, however, indeed, as Tui said, um, if communities that have tenure um, can, in our instance, opt in to uh, the scheme that you can earn um, you know, you know, more finance for your community, it comes with the ability and the need 
to meet the requirements that you can monitor, you can maintain, you can verify, and you can report. Um, and so communities will need to have that ability and that willingness to comply. Uh, one aspect of what we have been doing in Guyana is um, doing what we call a CMR, the Community Monitoring Re Reporting and Verification in the communities and helping to improve their own capacity so that when they are ready and based on FPIC uh, and based on their own decisions, they can decide whether they want to be included in this process and have the capacity to be included or not. Uh, I think uh, for the RED, what Maria said was, uh, in order to forget to be uh, to be implemented, it needs change. So there is need for change to push for change. So if tenure means uh, that the right or the ability to uh, to obtain benefits from red, then we should uh, we should work to make the change to allow tenure to be changed. But if uh, if sorting out a tenure just means that we shift the responsibility over the governance of forest to local communities, maybe we shouldn't talk tenure, we should talk uh, what, what ne change needs to be for the good governance to allow a good governance for it. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank all of our panel for your, your insights and reflections today and to our, to our audience for posing challenging and stimulating questions. Um, we're breaking now for lunch, so please feel free to continue the dialogue over lunch. Before you leave, please take a moment to fill in the evaluation forms that are on your, your tables. We do take that stuff quite seriously. Um, and again, thank you so much for participating and please give our panel a, a warm thank you.